Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to have a, a somewhat, uh, uh, perhaps a different perspective, uh, I'm hoping, in the sense that I'm in an unusual position. I'm an atmospheric scientist. Uh, I do work with government and academic groups. And I'm also at a company that uh, works for profit in the technology space. So, and I'm at the IBM Research Labs in, uh, in Westchester County. Um, so we're doing work in a number of different um, environmental science disciplines, which are all coupled together. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit. Uh, so I just uh, have a list of a few of these, uh, um, you know, just to give a sense of the topic areas and, uh, that, we, uh, you know, that we're interested in and that we're pursuing. So one aspect of the kind of work that we're doing, and especially over the last number of years, has been the importance of uh, leveraging uh, both open technology, open, as, let's say it's open source uh, software, and also open data. Uh, now this is also quite consistent with the uh, uh, strong trends that we're seeing that have come out of uh, both the US and the EU governments around the notion of open science. So we view this as being a great way to evaluate technology, develop technology, but ultimately apply it to problems that we think are, are important. Um, and, and in particular, when we look at um, some of our uh, specific research areas, so these are all focused on problems related to the impacts of climate change. Uh, they vary from uh, extreme weather events to problems that are more uh, chronic. So on the, on the left, uh, you see a schematic of one of the challenges that we see in urban environments where you have uh, essentially a feedback uh, between the built infrastructure in a, in a city and how it affects the weather in the short term and also how it affects uh, climate in the long term. So this is under a notion of an urban heat island, but it's not just heating. There is this two-way feedback on both uh, from a thermal as well as a moisture uh, perspective. And that leads to uh, challenges in prediction, challenges in assessment, challenges in trying to determine adaptation strategies and having you know, some notion of, well, which strategies work well and which ones don't. Uh, other areas that we are also working in around water resources, which is sort of shown on the cartoon on the right. And again, there are feedbacks uh, between the water system and the atmosphere. Now, again, they affect weather, and they affect on longer term uh, uh, climate as well. So to try to illustrate a sort of a, uh, I, I debated about going into more detail in one topic, but I thought that given the, some of the diverse interests, I thought it might be useful to reflect sort of quickly on three different areas uh, that we're pursuing. Um, and uh, they all connect to the scientific problems that I outlined. Um, but there's uh, different levels of maturity. So the first project I'll talk about is around monitoring and prediction. Uh, particularly around water resources. Uh, that's a fairly mature pro uh, uh, project. Uh, another more recent one has been looking at uh, the impact of climate change in urban areas uh, that uh, through the lens of, uh, of equity. And then sort of an effort in between, you know, looking at uh, you know, can we improve the predictability of extreme weather events. So in each of these, there'll be uses of open source uh, technology and open data. Um, and uh, I'll try to uh, reference them, uh, but I have actually a complete list of them at the end. So this first effort uh, is a project that's uh, uh, occurring in the Adirondacks uh, that we started uh, 10 years ago. Uh, this is in Lake George. Uh, uh, it's about a four and a half hour uh, drive from here, I guess. Depending on traffic, it might be a little bit more. <laughs> but, uh, um, and this uh, effort was motivated by a long term uh, longitudinal study of the lake that showed that the water quality of the lake was changing. So, the, and if you're not familiar with this area, the water is uh, quite uh, pristine. Uh, there's essentially a billion dollar uh, um, sort of a tourism industry focused on people wanting to come to this very clean lake. And, uh, the, the water is changing. So the question is, why? You know, somebody might say it's climate change. Some might say it's uh, changes in land use, uh, changes in you know, practices 
you know, for uh, you know, for the towns, uh, all of the above, or others. So these were some of our uh, uh, hypotheses in building uh, this uh, this capability, uh, which has been in conjunction with partners, a nonprofit, uh, the Lake George Association, and the uh, University of Minnesota Polytechnic. Um, and the way we took this approach was, well, some of the underlying technology didn't exist, so we had to uh, build it, uh, adapt it, uh, capabilities that were in the open community to essentially build a couple of modeling and observing system. So the ability to monitor the, the lake, the lake environments in detail, and then not just monitor, but then take those data and being able to use that to inform models, and the models being able to inform the observing system. So it's a, it's a two-way two combo. So um, just to put this in perspective, uh, so here's a map of uh, Lake George. Okay, it's, it's uh, rotated on its side because it uh, runs uh, primarily from uh, south to north. Actually, the water flows south to north uh, as well. Um, but we, uh, we have about 50 observing stations with about 500 sensors. And so these are sensors that, well, actually, I'll just show you some pictures of some. So these are uh, sensor platforms that are on the water, in the water, above the water, around the water. Uh, in the land, uh, et cetera. So uh, with some bias, there's a fair amount of my part, atmospheric scientists, there's a fair bit of meteorological observations, uh, but we're also uh, you know, take information about the soil conditions, uh, about uh, what's going on in the water, so that's both uh, chemical as well as physical properties. Um, and then associated with that, uh, you know, we built uh, an IoT platform to manage the data. So this is uh, leveraging you know, uh, off-the-shelf components and software and hardware, but to be able to manage these uh, stations in an automated way with the two-way coupling that allows us to do adaptive sampling. So if we can predict something that's interesting going to happen, we will ramp up the sampling uh, and manage the data as well as power and communication. Um, and um, we make the data openly available to one of our partners. And so this is just a snapshot of the uh, uh, dashboard that our uh, partner, the Lake George Association, uh, is using. It's a very simple uh, uh, illustration of the, of the data, uh, but that's to you know, their audience, which are you know, stakeholders that live in the region, that have businesses in the region, and as well as their own monitoring of uh, of lake conditions. So let me uh, briefly talk about the models. So the models are, uh, are also coupled because of the focus on water. Um, so, and uh, we start with, well, I mean, I'll always uh, say that everything starts with the weather. And, and in these situations, it really does. Uh, but just with the weather, it's insufficient. So the weather, weather uh, provides information and forces what happens on the lake and in the lake. Uh, the weather also focuses what happens in the land around the lake. So think about uh, if you have a heavy uh, uh, rain event, you'll have runoff, uh, the runoff that goes into the lake. Uh, you have uh, thermal uh, coupling between the atmosphere and the lake. So all of that has to be modeled. We use three different open source modeling systems, which we then couple together uh, to do this. And we do this at the lake scale. So if you look at the map on the left, you know, we start from a regional perspective of, uh, of the Northeast and New York State, and then going down to a third of a meter horizontal, excuse me, a third kilometer horizontal resolution uh, in the watershed. And that then forces the hydrology at uh, 41.7 meter uh, resolution, that's the uh, horizontal resolution. So that's, that's the spacing on a computational grid, because these are numerical models. Um, and then that forces a, uh, a model uh, for the three-dimensional uh, lake uh, hyperdynamics. And that's a variable resolution, but horizontally, you know, that's between about 27 and 70 meters. And this provides a sufficient scale. So I'll only quickly show a couple of short examples. So this uh, video, which I hope to find, is just a simple three-dimensional visualization of a weather model output. You can see uh, on, this, on that 
terrain surface, uh, overlays of wind and precipitation, and then two cloud properties. One was with cloud water density, which is a simulation of clouds, and then there were surfaces of uh, reflectivity, which shows a, a, what a, if you have a radar system at Lake George, that's, that's a simulation of what you see. And similarly, uh, through our partners, we make these data only available, and again, through this simple dashboarding, you know, a, uh, uh, someone that comes to the dashboard can pick a location and look at uh, specific uh, forecasted weather conditions uh, at uh, high resolution. Now, we also take these models and try to create derived uh, uh, models. Now, this is, this is not yet an open model, uh, but it's a, uh, an ecosystem model, which is looking at the constituents of nutrients and their effects on particular biota in the lake. So what you're seeing in the animation is across a transect. <laughs> There's a, a pointer here, but uh, there is a, if you look at the map the, at the upper left, this is a transect which corresponds to the x-axis in each of these um, uh, 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 maps. And then you're seeing the vertical distribution of uh, physical and chemical content, uh, as well as um, uh, biota, like you might then have, for example. And this gives us an indication of what quality can be impact. Um, let's see. Let's see, this is yeah, so here's an interesting perspective on technology. We started working with the Unity gaming engine to create three dimensional visualizations, you know, of, uh, to combine a lot of the uh, observed data. Um, and at the time, uh, Unity had an interesting uh, business model where you would buy a license to their software to build the models but then you can openly disseminate the visualizations. Um, and that's an interesting hybrid model. Uh, but um, I, I don't know much about the, the business decisions, but my understanding is that that uh, business model no longer exists. So they've changed the business model so that to kind of block the use of open, uh, open dissemination of visualizations. Uh, but we still are keen on trying to leverage the advantages of both proprietary and open technology to drive, uh, to, to drive the research areas. So um, th this, uh, this video uh, you know, goes through uh, a number of different uh, data sets as part of this, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the next, uh, the next topic. And if there's interest in you know, for anything here, we can certainly be using that. So the second uh, effort that I want to talk about uh, is a relatively new one that really started only, I believe, beginning of uh, this year. So um, the U.S. Department of Energy, has, uh, the Office of Science, started an important initiative uh, uh, last year on the development of a set of urban integrated field laboratories. And there are four of these uh, initiatives. Uh, this is part of a, a $94 million initiative uh, with a couple dozen institutions. Um, and the, the notion goes back to the challenges that I had in the beginning about uh, the interplay between the built urban environments where people live um, and the impacts of climate change. Um, and another uh, important perspective here is for, the, uh, for groups that are the least resilient to the impacts of climate change in these urban areas are feeling the brunt of those impacts. And, have, and also have the least resilience for you know, any reconstruction that might be needed, let's say, after the extreme weather event. So this is a multidisciplinary uh, effort uh, working on from the physics side to the social side and the interface uh, uh, between them. Um, uh, we're involved in one of these four initiatives, uh, which is led by the Arizona, Arizona State University. Um, and it's focused on the urban uh, core uh, in, the, in Arizona. So that's looking at Phoenix, uh, Tucson, and Flagstaff, and then also the regions in between. So this represents different classes of, uh, of disadvantaged communities that are being impacted. And of course, in that region, the focus is on the impact of heat stress and, and water resources. 
Uh, one of the particular areas that's our focus is uh, on modeling. And this is trying to take models to go from essentially global scale, so looking at the climate perspective, all the way down to sort of the infrastructure or human scale. So a set of cascading uh, coupled models. So not unlike the philosophy I outlined for water resources, but these are different classes, uh, classes of models. And just as a, uh, a teaser for this, uh, we don't have a lot of results to uh, that are published yet. So uh, uh, just as a, some of our early examples are focused on the computational technology. So one of the challenges of doing these kinds of models is the computational expense and also the storage expense. So we've taken an approach of using two different uh, open source uh, community weather models and coupling them in a way to go from the global to the regional to the local scale, but to significantly reduce by an order of magnitude the storage that's required uh, to drive these couple models and also to reduce the computational cost, not quite as much as, as that, uh, but also to increase the demand. So the last topic that I'm, I'll talk about is around uh, targeted forecasting uh, for extreme events. So um, I'll pick a, I'm picking a case study uh, from New York City from a couple of years ago. This is the remnants of Hurricane Ida. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, Hurricane Ida you know, was a land, I kept it before a hurricane that was a, had landfall in Louisiana on the 29th of August, uh, 2021. Um, it then decayed uh, into a post-tropical depression uh, you know, around West Virginia, interacted uh, with a, a, a moving front, and then uh, impacted the New York City area on September 1st. Uh, this led to a record-breaking rainfall, so over seven inches in a few hours, for, for example, uh, in, the, in, in the city. You start to see that moving in the, in the animation. So what was um, amazing about this event uh, was uh, the level of flooding in New York City. Uh, it was the first time the National Weather Service actually issued a flood emergency uh, for people to evacuate. Um, there were over a dozen fatalities uh, from drowning. People stuck in the, in the, in the basements of basement buildings. So although the Weather Service had very clear communications about the impacts, uh, the message didn't always get out. That's, that's a big challenge. Um, but uh, we wonder if we could show that you could do better predictions with longer lead times, you know, might that have made a difference? A key aspect of this work is collaboration with uh, uh, State University of New York at Albany that operates the New York State Designate. And so in particular, so here we see a map showing a targeted weather model on the left. Um, and it's uh, showing an area where we're modeling New York City at 667 uh, meter resolution. You see locations of National Weather Service uh, weather, uh, weather stations, that's in, in the dark red. And the dark gray is showing complementary locations operated uh, as part of the New York City. So this is an example of uh, one of the simulations uh, you know, at a high level, you know, we're looking at the precipitation, it looks pretty good at a regional scale, but you know, sort of the devil's in the details. The impacts were local, so accuracy at a regional scale, well, that might look good, but <laughs> in practice, is not useful, you know, towards this goal of having better predictability in ways of impact. So when we start to look at this in more detail, we see a map on the right from the New York State Mesonet that shows the locations and um, a maximum one hour rainfall. Uh, you know, again, these are very impressive of, of rain rates. And we look at uh, our model of results, we see some reasonable correspondence, but we're not capturing the highest precipitation, particularly in the out of curves. And, and that's, that's problematic. If we look at this in a little bit more detail, so these are site-specific forecasts. Uh, so we're looking at two locations for the New York State Desert, one in the Bronx and one in Queens, uh, that had over three inches of, uh, per hour of uh, maximum rainfall. And the plots in, um, in blue are showing the observations. The plot in red shows the model output. And there's pretty good correspondence, uh, but the intensity is low. 
compared to what we actually observe. And the timing is within an hour or so. But the thing to keep in mind, this kind of forecast would be available a day ahead of time. So the open questions are, is that level of error uh, tolerable, you know, given those challenges? And we were able to show that you know, we could actually improve predictions you know, of the level of impacts, even with some inaccuracies, you know, with sort of day ahead of the lead time. And we think that can make a difference in, in, um, in, in decision making. And, um, and, and the data from the New York State Investment is critical to be able to make this kind of analysis. So let me, in conclusion, uh, here's a list of some of the many open source technology packages that we're using, ranging from underlying techniques for the observing system to numerical models. Uh, if anybody wants to see this list, I'm happy to uh, share it. Um, and there are others, but these are the primary ones associated with these, you know, the, the three projects I outlined. Um, and then here are some of the openly available data sets that we, we use in the three uh, uh, efforts that uh, out, I outlined uh, as well. And again, if anyone's interested in these details, I'm happy to share. And uh, with that, uh, if uh, there's time, I'd like to take some questions. Suggestions for improving um, uh, climate, like black in the sun, burying forests, uh, diminishing agriculture. Uh, has there been any thought about applying AI to determine the effectiveness of those? Uh, uh, there, are, there is, and, and we're, we're among many, many that have done that. But my view is that AI alone is insufficient. Because one of the challenges is that what would you use for training purposes? Because you have to have information about future states. Uh, it's one thing to train a model based on reliable historical data. Such data doesn't exist for our future climate states. Okay. So ultimately, we have to start with the fundamentals, and that's based on, let's say, on the physical sciences. And so one can examine the um, the uh, uh, effectiveness of, let's say, such adaptation strategies by introducing those as perturbations into climate models running at the appropriate scale. That's what we've done and, and others. Um, that could then be used to create appropriate training sets for, let's say, a decision support based AI model or an AI model focused on particular impacts that are not part of the environmental uh, prediction. So my view is you, you really have to Combine them together. The numerical models are insufficient on their own. The AI models are insufficient uh, on their own. But putting them together uh, uh, can create effective solution. And, and we have actually taken that approach in practice for weather-based uh, impacts, such as footage prediction. Um, but the, the, the ones that are weather-based are, in some sense, easier. You can wait a few days and then. You then have, have data to actually validate and improve the model. You can't do that for climate. But nobody's done it. Uh, oh, no, no, people, yeah, we're doing work on that, and there are and groups in, in the academic community uh, as, as well. Uh, okay. uh, I'm not aware of anyone uh, on the commercial side uh, uh, doing that directly. Uh, more that are focusing uh, on the, uh, sort of the physical state. Uh, yeah, so the question was about how structures fit into the uh, into the predictive models. So a lot of these models operate at uh, a significantly coarser scale uh, than that. So the buildings have to be sort of aggregated. So, like in a in a weather model, the uh, the, uh, the the building structures are incorporated, but aggregated to the, the to that scale, of 500 meters or a kilometer, and but that includes um, the characteristics of the surfaces, um, uh, the heat uh, profiles, uh, the, the thermal you know uh, uh, characteristics, 
uh, as well as other aspects like, uh, uh, you know, especially for uh, open areas, you know, what's, you know, is it green, is it asphalt, is it uh, in particular plants? So those are incorporated uh, as well. And as you get to finer and finer scales, which is one of the intents of the project with um, Arizona State and the DOE, um, the, those detailed building information then gets incorporated you know, uh, in, into the models. Uh, one aspect of this is, uh, you know, is scale matching. So you know, if, if you're incorporating details that, you know, that the model can't resolve, then you, know, you don't incorporate that. So that, there's um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, sort of tuning you know, to, that, uh, to the kind of information that's available. And then there are lots of groups trying to acquire highly accurate representations of buildings in the, cities, in the city structure in order to bring them into these kinds of models. I think it was like an ad um, Structure, you know, like something like that to, you know, go further? Uh, you mean, uh, so I didn't quite uh, catch. Oh, well, I mean, we've not uh, done that. I know other groups that have done that that focus on, you know, on hydraulic, you know, uh, uh, models for engineering. The only kinds of things that we've done is um, making changes to, uh, uh, so the building surfaces, and then looking at how they impact. So let's make all the roofs green. Uh, does that actually help or not? Uh, you know, painting the roads white and painting buildings white to increase the albedo or energy reflected back in the atmosphere. Uh, does that really cool things off or not? Or are there unintended consequences? Unintended consequences where because you're changing the feedbacks between the, the tops of buildings in the lower atmosphere. You're going to change the atmospheric flow. Um, is that going to trap pollution? Um, so these are things that can be can be modeled and then provides information for uh, for decision makers or, or or machine learning tools that uh, help in decisions. So that's a good question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.